But first. This is a Fox News alert. Terror hit the heart of Western civilization today after an attacker ran over and stabbed dozens of people just outside the Houses of Parliament in London. At least five have died so far, including a police officer and the attacker. Several eyewitnesses described the terrifying scene. It was horrendous, yeah. absolutely horrendous. There's a body next to it on the ground, it's not, not moving, quite a lot of blood on the pavement. We needed to get somewhere safe. No, basically, we are just coming across the bridge and then we just heard a bang and then we just saw three people in the road. I just saw a car go out of control and just um, go into uh, pedestrians on the, on the bridge. Three shots down to like 10 feet away from me, it was that loud. And I was like, whoa, whoa. But perhaps we shouldn't be surprised at all. Just six months ago, London's new mayor, Sadiq Khan, said that terror attacks are, quote, part and parcel of living in a big city. In other words, it's just part of the deal. You can't have opera, soul cycle, and Sunday brunch without the omnipresent risk of being crushed, beheaded, or blown up in the name of Allah. It's just baked into urban life. But is it actually? If you're over 35, you may remember a time when terrorism wasn't inevitable in big cities. It wasn't always this way. We made it this way, or rather the people in charge did. how they do that? Through reckless immigration policies that pretty, pretty much none of us were asked to endorse, much less vote on. Some of us didn't even know they were happening. Western cities got dangerous when they imported radical religious ideologies from other countries. Nobody in government wants to admit that because it reflects poorly on them, but it's true. And increasingly, voters know it's true, despite the official ban on saying it's true. In heavily Islamic areas, terror is depressingly common. Elsewhere, it is vanishingly rare. The data prove that. You can look it up. Most Muslims are great people, of course, and good citizens, but over time, it is a numbers game. A poll last year found that 23% of British Muslims supported Sharia, 4% openly sympathized with suicide bombers. That's the reason terror in London is inevitable, not the inherently evil nature of cities. Maybe too late to stop any of this, but at least let's stop lying about it. Well, for an update on the situation in London, we go to Fox News correspondent Benjamin Hall, who is there. Benjamin? Well, Tucker, yeah, as you've just been saying, a really brutal attack, not only in the heart of London, but at the very heart of the UK government. And this all coming at a day when the spring was coming out and things were moving forward. It began at about 2.35 this afternoon when a car veered off the road into pedestrians who were crossing the famous Westminster Bridge. At about 35 miles an hour, he mowed them down, sending one lady flying into the river, uh, many others into the wheels of oncoming cars. He then proceeded down the road towards the Houses of Parliament where he crashed into into a gate before jumping out, taking out a long knife and killing a policeman. Soon after that, he was shot dead by two others. The streets around it were cut off, helicopters overhead. The River Thames itself was cut down uh, and no access to that. However, the British Parliament was defiant and Theresa May, who was herself in Parliament at the time, has spoken out today. Here's what she said. That is why it is a target for those who reject those values. But let me make it clear today, as I have had cause to do before, any attempt to defeat those values through violence and terror is doomed to failure. Now, that sentiment has been echoed around the world, not least in Brussels today, where it is a year on to the day where 32 people were killed in an ISIS-inspired attack there. And there are other similarities with other ISIS attacks. The use of a vehicle has been widely used before, uh, not only in Berlin, but also in Nice and indeed here in London. Many people really pointing the finger at ISIS now, and the police say they know who was responsible. They say it was tied to Islamic terrorism, but they're not yet releasing his names. We know five people so far dead, including a police officer, including the attacker himself and the 30-year-old lady. But big questions being asked today. Are the streets safe? And has terror managed to affect the very heart of this country? Back to you. Benjamin, thanks. Well, Nigel Farage once led the UK Independence Party. He has spent years warning that attacks like today's are an inevitable byproduct of mass immigration. He joins us now from London. Nigel Farage, thanks for coming on. So it seems clear from this vantage that this is part of something much larger, and it's pretty clear what it is. I wonder if that's as clear to the leaders of the political parties in Great Britain. <laughs> well, I remember about five years ago, I said that we had a fifth column living inside our own nation. It was the first time in our history that we had people living amongst us that wanted to destroy our values and actually even wanted to kill us. And I remember the absolute wave of condemnation 
uh, that I came in for. Uh, what I've seen today are um, a lot of people, the great and the good of this country, uh, the people that did irresponsibly open the doors, uh, the people that refused to accept uh, that within some parts of Islam there was a growing problem, uh, and they're all saying how awful and appalling it is. And I do actually think that the moment has come for us to actually point the blame. You know, what these politicians have done in the space of just 15 years may well affect the way we live in this country for the next 100 years. Well, I mean, I don't think there's any question, and, and Great Britain is not alone uh, in that. Is there still a sanction against those who say what you just said in public in Great Britain? I know that's been true for a long time. If you say that out loud, somehow you're the bad guy. Is that still the case? Well, um, I was um, the other week uh, doing a radio show here, uh, and I talked about Sweden. I talked about Malmo uh, being the rape capital of Europe, and I'm currently under investigation. Uh, by Ofcom, who are the regulator here uh, for all broadcast media. Now, I don't anticipate uh, receiving a heavy fine, but it just goes to show, doesn't it, uh, that actually we do not quite enjoy free speech in this country in the way in which we should. No, the country that invented it no longer has it. But, but what's the, I mean, if you, just to ask you to play psychiatrist for one second, what's the thinking here? Why would the leaders of a country whose job it is to protect the citizens who voted for them be so angry at anybody calling, you know, things as they see it, telling the truth. What, why is that a threat to them? Well, well, this was when Tony Blair got elected back in 1997. Uh, his aim was to create a genuinely multicultural society. In fact, he said he wanted to rub the noses of the right in diversity. Uh, Peter Mandelson, one of the architects of New Labour, said we sent out search parties all over the world to find as many immigrants as we possibly could. And, you know, look, I'm not against immigration. I want us to have sensible, managed, balanced immigration. But for goodness sake, you have to vet people. Uh, and that was 20 years ago. And, and, you know, today, when Donald Trump, and surely this is the big takeout, is that when Donald Trump tries to make America safer, when Donald Trump tries to make sure that these scenes that we've had in Paris and Brussels and Berlin and now London aren't repeated in America, we get people on Fifth Avenue and behind me in Westminster, out on the streets, protesting. Uh, it seems to me uh, that our political leaders really ought to start saying sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure any societies ever behave the way Western societies are behaving now in this masochistic way. So what are the specific lessons for U.S. policymakers in the wake of something like this? Uh, there are two, I think. The first is to be desperately careful about who you let into your country. And yes, I know the vast majority, 80% plus, you know, of Muslims living in Britain, according to our surveys, want to be integrated and respect our way of life. And the last thing we need to do is to alienate them. But you can't have open door immigration and not bring in terrorism. That's point one. And that's exactly what the president is trying to do. The second problem uh, are that some of those communities uh, that exist within our countries are, and I'm quoting Britain here as an example, uh, through our state-run schools and our prisons being radicalised. It's hard to believe, isn't it, that actually in British prisons it's now one of the major sources of Islamic terrorist recruitment. Uh, and frankly, we've simply got to get tough and we've got to give our security services uh, all the weapons uh, that, that they need to try and counter this threat. Good luck and God bless you tonight. Nigel Farage, thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, for more analysis of the atrocity today in London, we go to our terrorism panel. Dr. Waleed Ferris is a Fox News national security and foreign policy expert who advised both Mitt Romney and Donald Trump during their presidential campaigns. Jillian Turner worked at the White House National Security Council during the Bush and Obama administrations. They both join us here in Washington. Um, so for, first to you, Waleed, this is something we've seen before in effect, but it's more shocking because it took place where it did, right in the center of central London. Is this part of an offensive? Can we consider this an isolated case? I mean, what, how should we consider this? Look, ideologically, it is an offensive. It's part of an offensive. This is a cosmos of, we don't know if it's jihadists, but terrorists. What stuns me about this operation is when I observed it, a knife and a car. Yes. No machine guns, no explosives, no B7s. That defeats a lot of the systems that we have. How can we detect, how can we vet uh, the weapon? Because now the weapon is the mind who is recruiting, who is uh, basically radicalizing. Are we good at vetting? That question is asked in Europe and now it's asked here. Yeah, and I mean, it does seem 
events like this do add resonance to the debates that we're having about who ought to be let in and the idea that anyone who wants to come here has a moral right or a legal right to come here. Mm -hmm rubs up against this in some real ways, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It does. Um, I, I would add, tack on to what Dr. Ferris was just saying, that to me, this attack is right out of ISIS's playbook. I mean, normally in the aftermath of an attack like this, you have to go out hunting for clues about the perpetrator. But right. in, in this case, it's right in our faces. I mean, ISIS has literally instructed its followers to weaponize vehicles, to carry out attacks in very public places for maximum sort of PR effect and things of that kind of nature. They have uh, they have also instructed people to um, carry out attacks in the very heart to kind of take the fight to the West, take right. it out of get it out of the Middle East, bring it to the heart of Western Europe if you can. So to me, when you get to the point at which you can no longer even state the obvious, it becomes a problem. And that's the, the point at which I feel, we, the point we were getting to of, of a few months ago. Now the tables have turned, though. And I would say to Mr. Farage, this is the first terrorist attack, major terrorist attack in the Western world under the new world order with President right, Trump here right. at home, mm -hmm. Theresa May in the UK. So let, this is very telling, the and next 48 hours. No, I think, that's, I think that's exactly right. But as you just said, Belit, I thought wisely, when attacks are committed with vehicles and knives, it suggests that if someone's here to hurt American citizens, there's nothing you can do about it. In a sense, and the other question that it raises, knowing that yesterday we had that big meeting of anti-ISIS with yes. all these ministers, presidents, at the same time you have the question, so if we defeat ISIS in Mosul, if we defeat ISIS in Raqqa, Will this mean that we won't have those ISIS exactly. jihadists here? That's, That's right. a major question. We need another strategy here. It's not just about reducing ISIS geography. Exactly. It's reducing ISIS ideology. Right. The, the defeat them in Baghdad so we don't have to fight them in Boston turns out to be nonsensical. Not anymore. Right. Not anymore. Exactly. I thought it was nonsensical then. Thanks for joining us, both Thanks. of you. Up next, President Trump was mocked by almost everybody, all the cool kids, when he claimed his personal communications had been monitored by the Obama administration.